Hello everybody, uh, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Tonight I'm continuing in the study of the book of John. Now, if you have not seen the previous studies on John, please go back and watch this from the beginning. I, I think the book of John is the most important book in the entire Bible. Uh, all the other videos are available on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. But now I'm going to pick up where I left off last time, uh, beginning chapter 17, verse 1. Now, I'm what I call a KJV firstist. So I'll read the verses first in the KJV, but sometimes I like to look at it also in the Amplified Translation. The Amplified is like a, a translation and a commentary blend. So sometimes I find that to be helpful. All right, let's begin. Chapter 17, verse 1. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy son, that thy son also may glorify thee as thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. All right, I'll read those verses in the Amplified now. Uh, this has a title for this chapter. Uh, the Amplified has titles and subtitles. It's inserted, and it says, The High Priestly Prayer. So when Jesus had spoken these things, he raised his eyes to heaven in prayer and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son so that your son may glorify you, just as you have given him power and authority over all mankind. Now glorify him so that he may give eternal life to all whom you have given him to be his permanently and forever. So the Amplified has inserted a, a few phrases in there to uh, help uh, explain it further. But uh, it's interesting. I, I, I didn't really think of it as a prayer uh, because in the KJV it says, these words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said. So when you when you were thinking about it, read it carefully, you can see the, he's lifting up his eyes to heaven and praying. But when I read it, I... I got the feeling that he was just talking to his apostles, as he does so often. But according to the Amplified, this is a prayer. And so Jesus is asking the Father to glorify the Son, which is Jesus. And he's speaking in the uh, second person. He's talking about himself as though he's talking about someone else. He says, thy son, that thy son may also glorify thee, as thou hast given him power over all flesh. So he's speaking in the second person, but it's about himself, because he is the this person, the son, and he is the he in these verses. Um, now, verse 3, and this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Now, it's a beautiful verse. But it's verses like this that uh, can cause confusion and a problem to many believers and false teachers. Uh, because it seems to draw a distinction between the Father and the Son as though the, the Father is God, it says, and this is life eternal, that they might know how thee, the only true God. So he's praying to the Father, and says the Father is the only true God. And then it says, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Uh, so a person can use a verse like this to say, see, there's a distinction. The Father is the true God, and there's a distinction, Jesus must not be true God. But what we have to do is we have to look at all of this 
in the context of all of the statements that Jesus makes and that are made about him and that, that clearly say that Jesus is true, the true God. Uh, for uh, Jesus, it says that Jesus is our great God and Savior. So that over and over, I'm not going to get sidetracked into trying to prove that. I've got a lot of playlists and videos that um, the, uh, the subject is. Uh, one is um, the identity of Jesus, and it's quite a lengthy playlist. And, and the other one is uh, the deity of Christ, uh, another lengthy playlist. So go to those playlists, watch all those videos uh, if you're not sure or convinced that Jesus is fully God, equal to the Father. But there's a verse like this that, that the, uh, the uh, people who do not believe in the deity of Christ, they would go to a verse like this to try to make their case. Let me read these verses in the Amplified. Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the one true, supreme, and sovereign God, and in the same manner know Jesus as the Christ whom you have sent. Well, it, it, uh, it phrase, rephrases it and inserts a, a, a few words and phrases that will try to, to tries to clarify this and to be helpful. Uh, so it says that you're the one true and supreme and sovereign God. Now the word sovereign, I don't really like the word sovereign because uh, Calvinists use the word sovereign to teach the, uh, a damnable heresy, that, that God controls us and, and man does not make any decisions and, and God is making us do everything. Man does not have a free will, but God, in God's sovereignty, he controls every thought, word, and deed. And if that was the case, then man would, not, would be an innocent puppet, and God would be the sinner, because he's making man commit sin. So it's, it's a damnable heresy, and it's a, well, the most evil philosophy ever invented, in my opinion. I've got a playlist, Calvinism Debunked. I hope you go watch all of that. But... Uh, here it says, and it continues, and in the same manner. So in the same manner, it says. Now that's an insertion, uh, but it's, I think it's in, uh, uh, true, the, the point that's being made. In the same manner that, that the Father is the one true God, in the same manner the Son, Jesus Christ, is the one true God. And so it says, Jesus, uh, that you may know Jesus as the Christ whom you have sent. All right, now let's go to verse 4 in the KJV. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. Well, um, in a way, he's, he hasn't finished the work because uh, uh, the, 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 the primary reason Jesus was sent was not to perform miracles and teach theology uh, and that is important but he when uh, when he says that he came down from heaven and the reason was so that uh, he can give his life as a ransom for many he said I came to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many so if under serving uh, how did he serve us well he taught us, and he set an example, and he performed miracles, you know, signs and wonders to prove that uh, his identity and his claims were true. Uh, but uh, let me see, where did I leave off? Oh, finished the work. He says, I have finished the work. The, the real work, though, is that the work that Jesus did for our salvation was he lived a perfect sinless life and that perfect life he lived is credited to me and you when you put your faith in Jesus. We refer to it as imputed righteousness. It's like a, uh, an exchange. Uh, my sins are put on Jesus and his righteousness is put on me because of my faith in him. Um, so 
uh, he lived this perfect life. That work is completed. But the work of him dying for my sins at this point in the writing, uh, at this point in his ministry, he's still alive. He hasn't died for our sins yet. Um, verse 5, And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Uh, well, there's a verse in the Bible that says, uh, all, all the glory is to God. Only God gets the glory. And then we see verses that say that the Father gets the glory. And right here we see that Jesus is saying, glorify thou me. You know, nobody deserves any glory except God. So this is another example of Jesus um, making a statement that can only be understood one way, that he has to be God. And he can't have the glory unless he's God. When Jesus makes statements like this, and also that calling God his own father, uh, saying the Father and I are one, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, these statements of Jesus are the reasons the Jews wanted to stone him and kill him, because he's claiming to be God, and there's no mistake. And they even say, you, being just a man, make yourself to be God. And for that, that's why he says, why do you want to kill me? Why do you want to stone me? He, uh, uh, because you call yourself uh, the, son of, the Son of God, calling God your own Father, and making yourself equal to God. And that's why they wanted to kill him. And this is another way that he's making a claim that, uh, that, uh, of glory, that only God has the glory. Verse 6, I have manifested thy name unto the men uh, which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. Let me read verse 6 in the Amplified. I have manifested your name and revealed your very self and your real self to the people who, whom you have given me out of the world. They were yours and you gave them to me and they have kept and obeyed your word. Now what's the word? What's the will of the Father? We've covered that earlier. Jesus says uh, that uh, uh, if you're a believer, you will do the will of the Father. And that, but then it also says the will of the Father is to believe on the Son. So this is what it's talking about here. He says, you gave them to me and they have kept and obeyed your word. Your word, your command, your will is to do believe on the Son. And they've done that, he says. Um, Now, verse 7 says, Now they have known all that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. Um, all things uh, whatsoever thou hast given me. I think this is a reference to all of the miraculous powers that Jesus has demonstrated. For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me. And they have received them and have known surely that I came out from thee. Out from thee is another way that this is expressed in the early Christian creeds. I have a playlist titled Early Christian Creeds. And uh, I've said it before, uh, but the, the creeds that were written in the, uh, you know, the, the second, third, fourth centuries, they, they, uh, they do a good job of ex explaining the Godhead, the, the, uh, the nature of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, the relationship, and they, uh, they, it, they, they take verses like this and incorporate that into the creed, like it says, it says, uh, and have known surely that I came out from thee. And they have believed that thou didst send me. So, uh, come out from him. So, this is a, a way that it's stated in the creeds. 
And so this is, um, this is not just, it's like an angel that was sent from God. This is, uh, the, the, the word of God that came out of God and was manifest in the flesh incarnate as the son of God, Jesus Christ, God manifest in the flesh. And so he is the essence of or the same substance of God. And, uh, and it expresses here in this way that he came out from the verse nine. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me for thine. They are thine. Well, you know, a Calvinist would take a verse like this to say, see, see, he, he didn't uh, die for the world. He doesn't love the whole world. It's just the, the, the few that are the elect. Uh, but it says that I pray not for the world. So the world as a whole is not going to be saved. But it's not because they're not able to be saved, but because they choose not to. Um, there's a difference between uh, pre, uh, foreordaining and where God is making something happen and, and uh, foreknowing. And foreknowing is the way we need to see this, is that... Um, I pray for them. These are the people that, that Jesus and the Father knew would put their faith in him. I pray not for the world, the world as a whole. Those people who they God in his foreknowledge knew would never believe in, in him. There's no point because God's not going to impose uh, faith on, on anybody who doesn't want to trust Jesus. So I pray that they'll believe if, if God already knows uh, that, uh, the future and it's not, he's not controlling it and making someone believe and not allowing others to believe, but he knows those in the future who would choose to believe. And so that's why it's, it's phrased. I pray not for the world, but for them, which thou hast given me for they are thine. Verse 10 and all mine are thine and thine are mine and I am glorified in them. Verse 11, and now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee. Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. Now, when it says Holy Father, uh, the only time, now I believe this is the only time in the whole Bible that the phrase Holy Father appears. Now, it may appear more than this time, but I, I do know that the term Holy Father is a name for God. And uh, the, in uh, the Roman Catholic cult, the, the, the popes, I, li I like to call them the dopes, uh, they have taken this title for themselves. And uh, in Roman Catholicism, they give this title Holy Father to their popes, which is blasphemy. Um, While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me, I have kept, and none of them is lost, but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. And this is a reference to Judas, uh, son of perdition. Um, now, some people take this verse, the son of perdition, and when Jesus referred to um, uh, Judas, I don't remember if he referred to him as the, the devil, or the Bible says that at this moment, the devil has entered into him. But some people will teach that Jesus actually is the devil. I'm not Jesus, but Judas actually is the devil. Uh, and that uh, the, um, in end times eschatology, they, they, they believe that this, uh, uh, the, the Antichrist will actually be Judas. I don't, I don't buy into that, but that's 
This is where they're getting it from, when it refers to Judas as the son of perdition. Um, verse 13, And now come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. So, and now I come to thee. So, so he's, he's saying his work's been done, uh, but he's getting ready to come to the Father. So this is getting close to the end of his ministry. And of course, the, the, the culmination of, of it is this, uh, when he's arrested and put on trial and crucified. So this is leading up to that right now. And verse 14, I have given them my word, thy word, and the world hath hated them because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Uh, given them thy word, which is just those the believers, the apostles, and even broader, the disciples, uh, the people who believed on Jesus uh, then and even now. It says, that they will be persecuted. Because, because we're, not, we're not of the world. Uh, there's a saying that as a, as a Christian, we need to be in the world, but not of the world. Of the world is like everybody else. Um, worldly. Doing, living a life that's it's uh, nothing but pursuing worldly things rather than living a life that's uh, pursuing spiritual things, uh, fellowship with believers, uh, ministry works, prayer, uh, Bible study. The, the, these are, are spiritual things and, and we are, are building up treasures in heaven as we do those things. But if you're of the world, you're not doing those things. You're doing worldly things like working on your career or, or trying to acquire wealth or fame or, or just entertainment and things like that. Uh, so it says that uh, they are not of the world, uh, even as I am not of the world. But we are supposed to be in the world, just like when Jesus says that you don't put your lamp underneath the table, you know, it, the, it, the light will not be spread. No one will see the light if it's under the table. Put it on top of the table so that everybody can see the light. And so we are in the world and the light of our faith our, and our uh, Christian life will shine and our testimony, it will shine and uh, uh, other people will hopefully, because of us, because of our efforts, they will see the light as we spread the seeds of the gospel so we need to be in the world where the, the, where the worldly people are. And when, when we hear, they hear the message and they also see the contrast, many times people will see such a dramatic contrast between a believer because they have peace, joy, and happiness and assurance. And so when, when you have that, you stand out like a sore thumb. And it's not unusual for people to say, why are you so happy all the time? Uh, verse 15, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. Yeah, we got it. We can't come out of the world because we've got ministry work to do. So we need to be here. Uh, but he wants us to be kept from evil. And they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them. Through thy truth, thy word is truth. Sanctify uh, is two, two things I guess we can take from this use of sanctify. Sanctify to be make, made holy. And that's what happens in the instant we put our faith in Jesus. We are deemed holy, righteous, imputed righteousness from Jesus Christ that we've received. Uh, but also sanctify means to set apart and separate. So sanctify us is to separate us. Uh, we're in the world, but we're also distinct. We're different. Uh, verse 18. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified 
through the truth. Now the truth is the scriptures and Jesus Christ, the word of God. The word of God, which is the written word in the scriptures and the word of God, which is the person of Jesus Christ, pre-incarnation, he, his identity was the word. First John 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Jesus' identity pre-incarnation was as the word. And so he, he, when it says, they shall believe hope uh, and the truth. So Jesus is also called the truth. He says, I am the way, the truth and the life. So the, 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 the truth is what we need to believe and Jesus is the truth. We need to believe in him. Verse 20, neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. So he's being prophetic, saying these apostles will go on a mission and then other people will believe. And throughout history, more and more people will believe in this uh, Christianity will grow uh, because of the, the word that we're the word being spread from faith to faith, the Bible says. For one person that has faith, they share it on another person that in turn gets faith. That, uh, verse 21, that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the scriptures say that when we believe in Jesus for our salvation, that we are in Christ and Christ is in us. It also says the Holy Spirit is in us and the Father is in us. So the triune God is in the believer. Verse 20, uh, verse 22, and the glory which thou gavest me, I, give, I have given them and they may be one even as we are one. Well, it's not our own glory that we, we receive. It's the glory of Jesus Christ because our, we don't have our own glory. There's nothing for us to glory in. Uh, there's nothing for us to boast about. All the glory and credit uh, belongs to Jesus because he's the one that did the, lived the perfect life. He's the one that died for our sins. All we did is just believe his claims that he is the Savior God, that he did die for our sins, that he does give us life everlasting when we put our faith in him. Verse 23, I in them and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Verse 24, Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. So this goes back to eternity, before the creation of, uh, of the universe, before time began. There was a love between, uh, in the, within the Godhead. In other words, the Bible says God is love, is is proof of the, the Godhead, the triunity of God, because God cannot be loved if there's no object for the love. It's impossible to have love if there's no object for it. So that's why God must be triune. So that the Father loves Son, Son loves Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit loves Father, and, and they love each other. Um, verse 25, O righteous Father, the world hath not known thee, but I have known thee, and these have known that thou hast sent me. So he's saying that the, the believers, his uh, apostles and disciples, they, they, have, uh, they have known thee, and these have known that thou hast sent me. They believe that Jesus was sent from God, that he is the Christ, the promised one. Verse 26, and I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them and I in them. So that's what Jesus prayed for and asked us 
for is is us to have lo the love of God in us and and exemplify it and live it and love not being just a noun but love being a verb uh, but the act of love uh, that that is a, a quality uh, in fact it's a command Jesus said I've convinced all the commandments all the laws just into this love God and love each other so um, this is um, when Jesus says my yoke is easy my burden is light he's referring to my yoke being connected to me to be in me and me and and, and uh, you and in, in uh, Christ and Christ in you this connection is easy it's faith and, and then after that though the burden on us is light love that's what he's asked us to do all right so that's the end of chapter 17 uh, I'll sum sum up the the gospel very quickly if you if you have, don't know this this is uh, good news the word gospel is a Greek word it means good news and the good news is that uh, Jesus Christ is offering you every person without exception this offer is made to you now you can receive the gift of life everlasting in the kingdom of God some people you might think of this as going to heaven you're promised that you will go to heaven if you do one thing. It's conditioned on one thing. Just believe Jesus' claims. He is your Savior God. He died for your sins. He's raised from the dead, proving that he does have power over life and death. And that's the sign he promised us so that we can have confidence that our faith in him is justified. So, uh, going to heaven uh, is, is not a reward for a, a man's good behavior. It's not uh, something that man earns through his effort and works. And it, it, the, the Bible says that's impossible to get into heaven through our own efforts. We need to understand that the only way to get into heaven is Jesus Christ. We put our faith in him instead of believing our, in our own efforts and our own works our own ability to resolve our sin issue. Instead, we believe in the efforts of Jesus Christ, the works of Jesus, the the uh, the death of, on the cross to resolve the sin problem. He paid for our sins. Believe in the, what Jesus has done. Don't believe in what you're able to do. What we're able to do to, to resolve the sin problem is, is nothing. Nothing can solve it. Jesus solved it though. So put your faith in Jesus. Receive eternal life, the gift of heaven. Receive it through faith in Jesus Christ. Now, once you receive it, uh, the Bible says that it is irrevocable and irreversible by either God or by you. So once you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you're guaranteed you're going to go to heaven no matter what. Isn't that wonderful? That's why a Christian has peace, joy, happiness because of this blessed assurance of salvation. Put your faith in him now. Thank you. Bless you in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.